Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our Red Letter Study as we move on to the book of John. As I said, I, I do not want to touch yet the Sermon on the Mount or the Olivet Discourse. So, instead we're going to move on to John and his extended speeches of Jesus. I say that, but actually the first one we want to look at is a very short one. It's an only interaction between Jesus and some Pharisees. And on this, and what we are calling, uh, what people usually call, the cleansing of the temple. Now, the first thing that should strike us is how John seems to put it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and the synoptic gospel put it at the end. And what's going on? All two options presented themselves to us. The first is that uh, John is being theological and not chronological. He's not trying to give us the order in the life of Jesus, but give us a certain theme that he thinks is important. That, most commentaries say, don't make sense. Because as you move along in John, you see that there is some chronology. Even, uh, not only will we will see three different Sabbaths, really one year after the other, but we will see that he's focusing closer and closer to that last week, and most of John is on that last week of Jesus' life. So it's just seem chronological. The other option is that um, this cleansing happened twice in the ministry of Jesus. At the beginning and at the end. And that makes more sense because John will present facts and even certain words that Jesus says that we don't find in something. It's actually the way Jesus answers seems completely different. And that's probably because it's a different story. Same, same situation happened, but at a different moment. The, the religious leaders don't seem to react as strongly questioning him and attacking him on all sides like we saw with the synoptic Gospels at the end. So again, it's probably that uh, Jesus, as he started out, after having done that miracle of giving life to nothingness, right, water into wine, well, he's tr trying to demonstrate who he is, not only by a sign, but by these, this action to his disciples. So I'm going with that idea, that, that this is the, uh, first of two cleansed of the temple. And like I said, the, the answers are really important. We're focused on the words of Jesus, and they're not that many, actually. But they're really important, I think. We do want to look at the entire passage itself to make sense of it. So, we begin in John chapter 2, where it says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers, sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables, and he told those who sold the pigeons. At this point you would say, it's the same story. Look at the answer though. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house. A house of trade. That's interesting because, again, in the synoptic version, he's going to say how they're uh, making a cave of robbers because they were taking advantage of people by their trading. They were just hiking up prices and forcing everybody to change their animals. You had to buy new ones from them. It, it was really a scam. But Jesus is not focused on this, on this in this story. He's actually focused on the fact that the house of the Father should not be a house of trade. We'll see later on that specific phrasing is so important. But for now, I can't help but open up a parenthesis and wonder, have we done the same thing with the Christian faith? Now, realize the temple was a place of prayer, as Jesus says in the other version. It was a place to worship God through animal sacrifice, of thanksgiving, or for sins. And here they are taking the out of court, called the Gentiles it was called, to make money. Now, either it was legit or not legit, they're making it, in, again, a place of trade. But the house of God was meant to be a house focused on God alone. This is where I come back to my little parenthesis. The Christian community should be a place where God is worshipped and focused on. But have we made trade of it? When here in the West, in a more lib uh, a free Christian uh, uh, modern state, um, so we have Christian entertainment, like music, 
and money and, and, and movies. You even have Christian writers who make a good living off of that. Is that what Paul meant by living of the gospel? I, I really don't think so. We're talking about people who would invest their lives in serving and caring the flock, right? Shepherds. That's the only way I see of that uh, Paul's words can be understood. So again, have we made trade of the house of God? Not I digress. Because again, the wedding is really interesting, right? You believe he's focused on the two ideas of a house. This was supposed to be the house of God, focused on the Lord, and you made it about making money. This is wrong. Now we're going to see that from this point on, John's going to show us two ways to react. The ways of the disciples and the ways of the others. And you'll understand why I say others very quickly. But we begin with the disciples themselves. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Where did they go? The scriptures. This is a song. A messianic song. A prophetic song about the coming Messiah. And they realized, wait, it's being fulfilled right now. Now, there's a big possibility when he says they remembered, he means later on, after the resurrection, we'll see later, he will again use that same phrasing and point to after the resurrection, they remembered this, they realized. So it's probably what he meant, he means here, remembered, not in the moment, but later, but still, their focus is on what God had said in his word. So what about the religious leaders, men who knew the Torah far better than the disciples did? How will they react? Good question. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Do something amazing and remarkable and maybe we'll listen to you, Jesus. Again, when John talks about the Jews, he's usually talking about the religious leaders. These men who know Torah should be remembering right now a lot of prophetic scripture about the Messiah. One, for example, uh, Malachi, and I'm probably not saying right, but Malachi 31 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Do you realize we're talking about John the Baptist here, right? And in John chapter 1, they come to him and ask him, Who are you? Are you the prophet, the Messiah? He says, No. Then who are you? The man who is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way. Now, if they believe him or not, it's still like, very interesting. This guy is acting in a way that we were told was going to happen. So what comes next should you know, light up a little uh, few lights in their heads here. And the Lord whom you seek will what suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, it will be the light. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. God says before this guy, we prepare the way after this guy. When the way comes, I will show up in the temple. Hello? It just happened chapter 1, and now in chapter 2, I'm showing up in the temple. You should start putting the pieces together. Even more is what it said in Zechariah. And like I said, the very wording Jesus chose to use. He's not saying much in our text today. You'll see, but he's saying a lot, actually, to connect back to Scripture. The last thing Zechariah tells us in his prophecies, he, sa he says this. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts. So that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be what? A traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. There won't be any need for people who trade. Again, Jesus' words were very chosen. He is the word of God made flesh. He is wisdom incarnate. He chose his words very carefully. You're making a house of trade. But because the Lord has showed up, you're supposed to stop doing that. Again, little lights should just click in their minds of those who are supposed to know Torah by heart. But it didn't. Instead, they asked for a sign. How does Jesus respond to this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? 
Again, it's a sad reaction from these others, these Jewish leaders. They're so focused on their ideology. This temple took 46 years to build and to put gold on it. It, it was a beautiful temple. They said it was plated with gold all around, even on the outside, because of Herod, what he did. It was, just, it was incredible. And it took many years of, of fixing it and rebuilding it. And, and it's a long story. You should look it up someday. It's, it's fascinating. 46 years. And they're focused on, look at how much time it takes. That they can't even realize Jesus said, okay, you want a sign? I'll give you one. Destroy the temple. And I'll build it back in three days. We know he means the body. But at this point, they think the temple. Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you one. I'll destroy the temple and I'll rebuild it. You do that and I'll rebuild it. Of course, he's calling them to put down the old covenant so I can give you something better. He's going to open the door if they would have said, okay, prove it, so he could witness them in greater ways. But still, he's saying, you want a sign? I'll give you one. And they're like, yeah, no, 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 forget it. We don't believe that. Because again, they're stuck in the ideology. We have a branch within Christianity so focused on miracles and signs and how important they are. And say, what's wrong with that? And when you try to show them through scripture why it's wrong, they say, ah, we don't want to hear that. That's your interpretation. Because again, they're stuck in their ideology like they were. They didn't want to hear the truth. They don't want to see it with their own eyes. You want passages that prove that you're wrong? Here they are. No, I don't want to see them. But I digress. How did the disciples react to this? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples, what? Remembered that he has said this. Like the first time. That's why I believe this remembrance happened later. And they believe what? The scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Jews, the Jewish leaders who knew Torah better than disciples, want signs. And when Jesus promised them to show them a sign, no, nah, no, thank you, we don't want it. The disciples? Only focus on what God said and believe in that. That's solid faith. See, John's not finished right now. He's going to give us a little addendum, if you will, an appendix. We, we know that when chapter 3 begins, it's another story, it's Nicodemus. So what happens at the end of this chapter is John's commentary through the Holy Spirit about um, true faith, honoring faith, disciple faith, and the wrong kind of faith. We just saw that these others, the Jewish leaders, wanted signs and they, they didn't want them at the end of signs. Well, there's another group of others that John presents to us. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Oh. Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. What was in man? Fickleness. If they're focused on signs and things that can be taken away and changed, then they're not rooted in something that's solid and won't be moved. That's the word of God, the eternal, unchanging word of God, like the true disciples. Their focus was on that. You see, John is showing us. This is the faith that pleases God in his word and he gripped on that. The one that looking for signs, when it's easy moved, and not even receptive to what has been said, God is not focused on that. And we, we need um, to be, be reminded of this, like I said, because of certain branches of Christianity that's become more and more popular and infecting a lot of evangelical, evangelical Christianity. But it's not just focused on them. Don't miss it. This whole thing is about Jesus being this great third temple. Oh, you heard me. The, the Old Testament prophesied and promised a third and great temple. And many say it's what's coming up in Jerusalem soon. But no, Jesus just said he is the third temple. His body, the incarnation, was God dwelling with us. It was the temple. It was destroyed and resurrected. It is over. It is resolved. 
To focus on another temple is to keep our eyes off Jesus as the true and great final temple. And his home, which is among the church, the living stones, and his temple there. We need to get our focus back on Christ, and not the details of all around us. Not this war here or this temple over there, but the fact that Christ is the fulfillment of it all and he did accomplish it. And soon, very soon, he will come and complete it and bring it all into execution. And we should wait in anticipation, looking up to him for this. I'm not no brothers and sisters. Be blessed.